everyone. Welcome back to the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. Appreciate you tuning in for part two on my, I guess, book review of the late great planet Earth. Yesterday's program, we talked about how an entire generation was literally bewitched by an event in 1948. They were greatly deceived and bought into a lot of foolishness and an entire generation of prophecy preachers did a ton of damage and basically discredited Bible prophecies by declaring their interpretations of these prophecies as like Bible, like it was the Word of God and they got everything wrong. They batted zero percent and uh, it's just very frustrating. If you did not see yesterday's program, you need to go watch that. It will help you understand a lot of foolishness that you have heard come from pulpits. And people, uh, they got caught up in the hype of events that were taking place back in that day. And so this book, again, it was written in 1970. And he's convinced that that generation, within a very short time, probably by 1988, all these Bible prophecies are going to be fulfilled Jesus is going to come back. He doesn't go all, you know, they always leave themselves an out. But people definitely thought that back then. Some were bold enough to write books saying that the rapture was going to come by 1988. And they, the things that they would say too, I, you know, I'd bet everything I have on this because I believe the Bible. And it just discredited the Bible. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you believe the Bible, but it doesn't mean your interpretation of the Bible isn't stupid. And there was a lot of dumb things that were taught. And so the rest of this book, I kind of took you to up to chapter four. And then, you know, and we probably got about one third through the book. And then the rest of it, honestly, I read it years ago. I, I couldn't bring myself to read through it again because it just makes me mad the whole time. It's frustrating and it feels like a waste of time. And nobody was going to want to read this today because while this would have been exciting reading it back then, you know, it, it isn't anymore because he is making, he, he's basically taking the global events, the political events of that time, and he is connecting it to Bible prophecy. The problem is things have changed in the world 53 years later. And so you realize just how wrong it is. It's like, why am I still, re why am I still reading this? This isn't how it's going to work. But what he ends up doing on the first chapter, or chapter five, when he gets into this, it's just called Russia is Gog. And this is, boy, the, the routine that he does in this book, I have heard from preachers my whole life. And it's so frustrating listening to it. But I, I want to read this one section to you in page 62. It says, since the restoration of Israel as a nation in 1948, we have lived in the most significant period of prophetic history. We are living in the times which Ezekiel predicted in chapters 38 and 39. So understand why this was so dangerous, what he said. And again, this teaching, and I don't believe it originated from him. I think he popularized it. But the previous generation got caught up in this hype, and some of them, their heads are still in it. But they, they declared those days the days of Ezekiel 38 and 39. This has messed up people when it comes to all things prophecy in a very bad way, and it's almost irreversible. It's almost irreversible. Thankfully, some people have. Uh, they've come out of the uh, bewitching that has take place, taken place in their lives, but many still have it. Many are still repeating these things, and it's very frustrating. And, I think, and so I think it's important because I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this book because, again, pretty much what it is, he goes through and he gives, he, he basically explains the origin of all of these nations like Russia, you know, China, and um, all these different places, you know, Iran, how they're Persia, and basically just showing how he's taking the Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecies that mention specific nations, and then he's connecting those nations with the nations of today because they have different names. And then he spends a lot of time going into his, you know, the history of them and explaining how, you know, Gog is in fact 
Russia, and he references a lot of sources, and obviously none of us are going to take the time to fact check these things. However, preachers for years have got up and said the exact same things and about Russia and the origin of these nations, and their source is not the sources that how Lindsay went into, and he may have done the research. He may have talked to the scholars. He might be right about his sources. I don't know. I don't have a lot of trust for the guy because he got so many things wrong. However, when Baptists talk about how they've studied this out, they've looked into the origins of these nations, you want to know what their source is? This is their source. So um, keep that in mind. I don't think people realize just how much this book affected a, a generation of preachers. And so they declared, and many still believe, that the events of 1948 and, and shortly after, the events that were going on in that day was Ezekiel 37 and 38, 39 coming to pass. I have heard preachers say, like he said earlier in the book, you know, it's like reading the newspaper today. And people will tell you, go read Ezekiel 37, 38, 39. It's like you're reading the newspaper. No, it's not. Okay. Now, here's what I, I need to take the time to do. And this is really important. But we need to, it's important that people understand how the Ezekiel prophecies, they were not failed prophecies. People, uh, dispensationalists, will often ask a very misleading question and they will ask if, you know, we believe that, you know, the Ezekiel prophecies were failed prophecies, you know, that the Zechariah prophecies were failed prophecies. Okay. I don't believe there's any such thing as a failed prophecy. In other words, God predicted this was going to happen and it didn't happen. Okay. No, here's what I believe. I do believe though, that there were certain prophecies that had contingencies in them and you can go read those contingencies there. They are there. They are spelled out in the Bible that this will happen if you do this, which means if you don't, then this won't happen. That's not a failed prophecy. That means be, because it would have been a failed prophecy if it still would have been fulfilled, even if Israel disobeyed. Then it would be a failed prophecy. Okay, a failed prophecy would be when God told them, if you eat the fruit, you'll surely die if they never died. That would be a failed prophecy. But no, they did die because... Uh, you know, that prophecy had a contingent, it, it had a contingency on it. And the contingency is if you eat it, you die. And if you don't eat it, you're not going to die. And so you have to, when you look at prophecies like that, you always have to check to see what did the people do. And God gave many prophecies to Israel that were contingent on what they did. So it's really important that we check and see, hey, what did Israel do? And you know what? Nobody wants to do that. Everybody's just like, no, God promised us to Israel. If they will do this, you know, if they will follow the Lord, if they will obey him, but they didn't. So that means there's going to be some things that are changed. And you say, okay, well then certain things aren't going to come to pass. Scripture is not going to be fulfilled. All prophecies are going to be fulfilled. But again, this is where we've got to understand prophecies are fulfilled through Jesus not through Israel, through Jesus, the one who came from Israel. The, the, you know, the law, it was given to Israel. It, you know, uh, the law was added because of transgression until the seed would come to whom the promises were made. The seed came and, and he came from Israel. He was born of Israel. He took on him the seed of Abraham. And Jesus fulfilled those things, yet we have people today looking for those same prophecies to be fulfilled through an ethnic group. That's not right. Prophecies are fulfilled through Jesus. Why? Because man wasn't capable of doing all those things. Israel wasn't capable of doing all those things. And so prophecies are fulfilled through Jesus. But what does he do in this book? He says the same thing preachers have been saying for a generation, a couple generations now, that if you want to understand prophecy, pay attention to Israel. No, pay attention to Jesus. And then you'll understand how these things were fulfilled. And people often, when they tell you their version of how they think things are going to play out, and it always involves Israel, and then people like me are like, no, that's foolish, that's wrong. They accuse us of denying that a prophecy is going to be fulfilled or whatever. 
And it's like, no, all the prophecies are going to be fulfilled. The question is, how will they be fulfilled? They believe through an ethnic group. I believe they're fulfilled through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, who was of Israel. That, that's what I believe. So I think it's very important. We understand Ezekiel's prophecies were not failed prophecies. The things were just fulfilled through Jesus. And so what he does, he goes through in great detail, explaining the origins of the different countries, how history backs up the Bible, and everybody's just been repeating these things. And so, um, you know, but I can, except I can understand one thinking the Gog and Magog prophecies need to be fulfilled before the millennium if they're only reading Ezekiel, but they will not be fulfilled before the millennium. And here's why. It, because uh, let's go ahead and look at what it says in Revelation chapter 20. It says in Revelation 20, verse 7, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's Revelation 21. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That's after the millennium. That's, that's after the millennium. And you said, yeah, but what we're reading in Ezekiel doesn't look post-millennium. Therefore, there must be another Gog and Magog. No. Here's what, you, here's what you're missing. The Gog and Magog isn't fulfilled until after the millennium because it's going to be fulfilled through Jesus, not through an ethnic group. That's what you don't understand. There are some things in Ezekiel 37 that uh, will be fulfilled, but it's going to look different than the way it looks in Ezekiel. Here's why. Because it was not fulfilled through an ethnic group. It will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you the fulfillment of some of these prophecies. And I want you to notice some differences because there are differences because of the fact that they were fulfilled through Jesus who brought in a new and better covenant with better promises. What people are looking to see fulfilled today is an inferior fulfillment of these prophecies rather than the superior the better fulfillment that we see play out in Revelation through Jesus Christ. So let me just show you one example. Okay, We're not going to go through all of Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. That would take too long. But in Ezekiel 37, verse 12, you all need to take note of this. This is very important. You've got to get this. It says, Therefore prop, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, many people, they make this figurative and they make it about Israel coming back to their land in 1948. The dry bones prophecy. People are still, they're still, how are you still doing this, people? Okay, that you, we should have learned our lesson by now. I get the previous generation, you got hoodwinked, you got bewitched. But listen, the proof's already out there. You were wrong about this. The 1948 was not the dry bones prophecy being fulfilled. Not even, not even close. It, but people are reading that and they're seeing a physical nation coming back, an ethnic group coming back. But here it says it's going to happen when he opens their graves. Oh my! It says, and I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Verse 26. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, here's what most of you are still doing because you haven't learned your lesson and you haven't confessed uh, you know, your sin of being deceived and being bewitched and being hoodwinked by the events of 1948. Here, here's what you're missing. I, I know I, I might sound like I'm being mean, but I'm, I, I'm just trying to tell the truth. I'm trying to say it nicely, but I'm just, I'm telling you the truth. Okay, here you are looking for an ethnic group of physical people that are on earth right now to be restored to a physical land 
and you believe that is the rebirth. And then people say too, now notice their bodies are there, but there's no breath in them yet. And that's because they're not saved. And, but after, you know, and what people connect to this, and it's not in this passage, but then after the rapture, you know, you're going to have 144,000 Jews get saved. There's going to be this great revival, and that's God breathing the spirit of life into them. And they're going to evangelize the world and all this wonderful stuff. Okay. All right. Well, assuming you're right, which you're not, but assuming you're right, notice how it says when all that happens that he's going to put his spirit in them and the Lord is going to make a covenant of peace with them, with Israel, with, a, with an ethnic group, with a physical nation. And it's going to be an everlasting one. And he's going to put his tabernacle in the midst of them. And he's going to dwell with them forevermore. All those with an ethnic group, with a physical people. That's how you all are interpreting that passage. Now, this will be fulfilled, but how will it be fulfilled? Well, I believe it will be fulfilled at the resurrection when they come out of their graves, when Jesus revives them, those saints of old, the, the believers, those of faith in the Old Testament, they will resurrect at the resurrection of the last day that we are waiting for. But guess what? So will we. So will the Gentile church, as you, as you all want to call it. They also will be resurrected at that last day. They also will claim the promises of Israel because we are, in fact, connected. We are a part of that. And he does a prophecy in here, too, after that. We don't have time to get in that about the two sticks coming together. I believe that's a picture of that. But, again, God's going to dwell with them. He's going to put his tabernacle in them. Another thing people do, they go through chapters 40 through 48, and they talk about the temple that's going to be built. And many are still... Y'all are still prophesying that this temple is going to be built and there's going to be sacrifices. There are Baptists that teach that the sacrifices are going to come back and it's going to be a good thing. There are a segment of Baptists that believe that. That is absolutely ridiculous. Jesus got rid of those things once and for all under the new and better covenant. The key to understanding 40 through 48 is you have to see the contingencies that are in there. Those things, the things that were promised in Ezekiel will not be fulfilled through an ethnic group. They will not be fulfilled through a physical temple. They will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And there will not be another temple. The only other temple that's going to come is an antichrist temple that Jesus has nothing to do with. That's the only other temple that's going to come. And here's proof. Look at this promise. So you all, you all want to take this promise and make it about a ethnic group, a physical people, God's going to dwell with them forever with an everlasting covenant for them. And you want to exclude Christians from that? That creates a big problem because look what it says in Revelation 21. This is after the Gog of Magog that we see in Revelation chapter 20. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Remember remember what he said in Ezekiel? And I'll put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. You shall know the Lord that I, the Lord, have spoken and perform it, saith the Lord. Uh, moreover, I'll make my covenant of peace with them. It should be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And notice, under the new and better covenant, okay, under the new and better covenant, because what is a tabernacle? Obviously, it's a tent, but even the, even the physical temple was referred to as a tabernacle. A tabernacle is just a dwelling place. Okay? A, that, that's what a tabernacle is. The original tabernacle that they had in the wilderness, it was one that it was a way God could dwell among the people, but it was also a way, too, to kind of separate him from the people, too, because they couldn't handle his holiness. They couldn't handle the glory of God because of their sinfulness. So they placed a tabernacle in the midst of them, of the people of Israel, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once in a year. And there were all these things that they had to do, all these cleansings, all these rituals. If they didn't do these things, they could die. But God's always wanted to dwell in the midst of people. And so God set those things up in the beginning, again, to reveal his holiness, to help him see these things. But understand, 
after Jesus Christ, so first off, Jesus paid for sins on the cross, but we understand too that one day Jesus Christ is going to return to this world and he will eventually, after he reigns and rules in righteousness for a thousand years, he will finally put an end to sin and death on this earth where it will no longer exist, where Satan will be cast in the lake of fire. All who are lost will be cast in the lake of fire. He will remove all all the bad things from this earth. And we see earlier in Revelation 21, there'll be no death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither should be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Jesus, this is why I still believe in a millennial reign of Christ because I do believe there are some things that do still need to be fulfilled. They will not be, they will not be fulfilled through Jesus or through Israel. They will be fulfilled through Jesus. And once he has removed all iniquity from the planet, to where there is nothing that offends and we have this new heaven and this new earth where everything is good, everything is righteous because of Jesus Christ, the tabernacle of God, it's not going to be in a tent. No, the tabernacle of God is with men. God himself will dwell on earth with man. Folks, that's better than what we see in Ezekiel 37. That's better than that. They were looking for a tabernacle that God would place to be in the midst of them. But no, we get something better. This planet will be God's tabernacle. He will dwell with all of us. And it goes on to say in Revelation 21, 22, and I saw no temple therein. Why not? Um, because we don't need sacrifices anymore. The sacrifices in Ezekiel 40 through 48 that they talk about, they were things they were supposed to do forever. Can you imagine having to do sacrifices forever? Well, that's what you would have to do under the old covenant, but under the new and better covenant that Jesus Christ brought in, one sacrifice, once and for all. So there is no temple. Why? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. We don't need, we won't need a temple. We have Jesus. Do y'all get that? Do y'all understand that? This So this Ezekiel 37 prophecy, the way... That, you, that a lot of people are uh, interpreting it. The way how Lindsay interpreted it doesn't make any sense. Because how is this special? Because here in Revelation 21, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he's going to dwell with them forever. In Ezekiel 37, it's with Israel in a tabernacle, and he's going to dwell with them forever. This is better. Okay? This is better. And it was through Jesus Christ. And so, again, and, and, and it's better that there's no temple. Jesus is the temple of it. We don't need a physical temple anymore. And people are missing this. People are not understanding it. People do not understand, thanks to dispensationalism, thanks to guys like Hal Lindsey, thanks to a generation that was bewitched by 1948 and the events that took place there, they don't understand how prophecies are fulfilled. They are not fulfilled through an ethnic people. They are not fulfilled. Salvation, just like sal we, all, we understand how salvation is not fulfilled through the works of the law, is not fulfilled through anything we do in our flesh, it's fulfilled by the works of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did all things pertaining to our salvation. Jesus Christ gets credit for everything. All glory go uh, goes to Jesus Christ and if, if when we interpret the Bible properly. And so, yes, I, I do. I agree with what Chuck Baldwin said, and I, I, I like how he said it, that prophecy is either Israel-based or Jesus-based. My prophecy is Jesus-based. Those of you who have an Israel-based prophecy, you are looking for a time in the future where God is going to set a sanctuary in the midst of Israel and dwell with them forever. While simultaneously having another tabernacle with men and dwelling them with them forever. So wait, so is it, so the thing is, well, he's God, he can do both. Okay, so is Israel going to get a special dwelling that we're not going to get? Obviously, that's ridiculous. It's clear God always wanted one people. So the, 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 the reason you're reading Ezekiel 37 through 39 and you're thinking it's something that has to take place, you know, now is because you're not understanding how it's going to be fulfilled. You are looking for it to be fulfilled through Israel. We are looking forward to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And so I believe in the millennial kingdom, there are things that are still going to be, you know, some loose ends and things, I guess you could say, that need to be tied up, things that hadn't been fulfilled. 
and uh, things that Israel was never able to accomplish. And Jesus is going to accomplish those things. That's how it's going to play out. That's the way it all works. And that's why you got to be careful with Old Testament prophecy. Obviously, I don't think anybody did not, you know, believes it's not going to be fulfilled. We just have disagreements on how it will be fulfilled. So this is, um, again, you know, this book it is just a reminder of everything that was wrong with the previous generation. And they won't want to admit that this is what influenced them. You know, a lot of guys will come, I didn't even read this, but the guy who influenced you did without a doubt, because you can't, you can't back these things up with the Bible. You can disprove these things with the Bible and all these things they said were going to happen. They didn't happen. It's not even a question. This isn't a matter of opinion. No, he was wrong. It's not my opinion. He was wrong. It's just a fact. He was wrong and people need to get a hold of that. And they need to admit that. And everyone who repeated his talking points were wrong. You were wrong about the budding of the fig tree. And, and I, I know that's hard to hear, but you need to realize that and understand that you, you were bewitched. And people need to understand, too, that, you know, talking to somebody who's bewitched can be a very difficult thing. And they need, it takes a lot to overcome that stuff. But I want to, but I want to read this one section, too. Um, about the revival of Mystery Babylon. To begin, it's the first paragraph in chapter 10. It says, It is not our purpose to be shocking or offensive. The prophecies of the Bible are a vital part of God's word, but should not be used for sensationalism. Why do you think I have that picture behind me there? Because, again, they've, they've sensationalized these things in a big way. They've put images in people's minds that have stuck, that they've, they've not been able to get around. And just the errors that he makes, how they have been repeated. For example, he has in here too, um, and I mentioned this this briefly in the last episode, but he puts the Megiddo Valley and the Valley of Jehoshaphat together. And that's why every, every Baptist, when they go to Israel today and they go to Megiddo, they look across that valley, all right? And let me show you this valley, okay? Check out this Look at how large and vast that valley is. And they'll look at that and talk about how the blood is going to flow to the horse's bridles. There's one of these days. Where where did they get that? That's where they got that from. That's not where that takes place. And I always thought that was the Valley of Jehoshaphat because I, I knew the Bible taught that that took place in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I knew that. And so the thing is, though, go talk to the Jews over there and they're going to laugh at you. Because they know where the Valley of Jehoshaphat is. You know where the Valley of Jehoshaphat is? See if you recognize this. It's right here. That valley directly there behind me, uh, you'll notice up in the, uh, okay, right in that area, that's part of the old city. Uh, that's a, a, uh, the corner of the eastern wall and the southern wall. And then over here is like where the city of David is. And that valley that runs in between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. I took this picture from the Mount of Olives and, and across that way. That is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where the Bible talks about that. Yet everybody's still talking about it in Megiddo. And, and I, I, you know, and it's like, oh, it's just it's a mistake. Yeah, but everybody's made it. How has everybody made that same mistake? They're reading from this. And so I say all, I say all this because, and I wanted to do this book review because this book explains what happened. This and this was a big thing for me because again, I had a lot I have a lot of trust for people and and I still love people who are in their ignorance are still repeating this stuff. But I wanted to know where it came from. I wanted to know how they got all these things wrong. And without a doubt, this man was bewitched by 1948 and the events that took place there. He was bewitched by the Judaizers, without a doubt, he was be you know he was wrong. He clearly had a lot of dispensational theology. He goes into all the classic Daniel seventieth week stuff in here too, that people are still repeating. He 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 does the same thing because they were deceived by that political thing that took place in nineteen forty eight, and they made it what prophecy is all about, and they went from a Jesus based prophecy to an Israel based prophecy. And it's, it got everybody distracted. And 
I think this guy just did a good job writing about just kind of the movement of that day and the talking points of that day. I don't think it, it probably didn't originate with him, but he popularized it and infected an entire generation and helped spread the bewitching, cast that Israel spell on him about the events of 1948, and people are still under it to this day. People, and, and uh, again, I'm not against going to Israel. I, I, I'm i hoping to go back again very soon. But people get bewitched when they go there. When you go there, you better have your doctrine right. You better go skeptical. You better watch out who you go with and what they're going to tell you because people are being fed a lot of baloney when they go to Israel and they don't under, they don't they don't see that they don't understand they're going home and they're repeating all these things to their congregations and messing up another generation and so uh when when you, it, it was just very eye opening when i read this cuz like yep that okay that's where that came from that's where that came from and it's so it's so enlightening to read this 53 years later you know i can i can understand how people got caught up in, it in 1970 when all these things are going on, but it's 53 years later. He was wrong. He was wrong. And just understand you're going to have a tough time convincing people of that because they've been bewitched. And if you want to know who did it, who bewitched them, it was the same people that had bewitched the Galatians that Paul talked about. Same thing. And so watch out. Whenever somebody tells you you want to understand prophecy? Pay attention to Israel. Mm. Don't let them bewitch you. Don't, don't do that. You know what you do? You pay attention to Jesus. That's what you need to pay attention to. And if you do that, you get focused on that, you'll see through all this foolishness. So that's all we're going to do on the subject of the late great planet Earth. Uh, I'm so glad to finally get this done and get it off my chest. And I hope that uh, if, if you find it, read it, and it'll, it'll be eye-opening. I would encourage pastors that are triggered by this right now, go read it. And then when you see yourself being quoted in there, which is how it's going to feel, ask yourself, hey, I said that in my pulpit last time I did a prophecy sermon. Did I get that from the Bible? Go, go check and see if you can find it in the Bible. You won't be able to find it because it's not in the Bible. And and. Uh, and look at how many things that you're still repeating that are outdated and wrong. And it's in a lot of preachers, their minds are still in the 1970s uh, when it comes to things. And it's just like, man, you can't say that anymore. That's not, that's not the case. It is, we are not living in that situation. So anyway, I appreciate you watching this. I hope you'll share this with folks, help get the word out. And we appreciate everyone uh, doing that for me. So God bless you. We'll see you all next time.